I'm going to talk to you for a little bit here about what is the gospel. A lot of confusion out there about this today. What is the gospel? Where is it defined? Well, if you know your King James Bible pretty good, you'll go to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. We're going to turn there. You can turn there in your Bible a while. Let me put a line underneath here. First Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 through 4. We read here, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So we have three things there that make up the Gospel. We have, number one, the death of Jesus Christ. Number two, we have the burial. He was... He died, he's buried, and most importantly, we have the resurrection. You say, why is that most important? Well, think about it. Joseph Smith shot to death when he was trying to get out of the jail, the founder of the Mormon cult. Did he shed his blood? Yes. Did he die? Yes. Was he buried? Yes. Was he resurrected? No. Muhammad, don't really remember how he died, but uh, don't really care. <laughs> you know. But the fact, the fact of the matter is, did he shed his blood? I don't know. But the fact is, he died. Was he buried? Yep. Has Muhammad come up? No. Every pope that's ever lived, did they die? Yes. Were they buried? Yes. Have they resurrected? No. One will in the future, but that's because it's going to be a satanic power type of a thing. Only one Savior, one head of one religion, died, was buried, and resurrected. But how does this relate to the gospel, you say? Turning your Bible to Romans chapter 6, I'm going to show you how it relates. And you get people that claim that they believe the gospel, and yet you actually examine what they're preaching and teaching and their profession of faith that they make, they don't believe it for one second. Romans chapter 6. Now remember, as we read through this, death, burial, resurrection. Remember those three things. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. We're going to keep reading here. But notice the three things very present in there. We've died with Christ. Our old man, we'll see later here, is buried with him, and we are resurrected to walk as new creatures in Christ Jesus. And it's ironic because you have people that say, I believe the gospel here, and yet they deny these points. They haven't died. They're still the same person as before their profession of faith. The old man was not buried. There's no change. They aren't resurrected as a new creature to walk in the newness of life. Have these people really, truly believe the gospel? No, they haven't. They are not born again. They make a profession of faith, but there's no new birth. There's no supernatural thing that happened in their life with, with salvation. It's all about them. It's an act of will. It's an act of their mind. I believed. I put my faith in 
Jesus' death on the cross or faith in His blood. That's another good one. And I, I've done this. I did this thing on my own. Where's the death, burial, and resurrection? You see? They'll go in there and they'll chop it up, all this stuff. But you'll see this is missing from their testimony. Let's continue. Verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Hmm. Doesn't mean you're going to be sinlessly perfect. Heretics teach that. Heretics will teach that it's a sinless perfection thing and that you can at any time lose your salvation because of sin, willful, uh, you know, mortal sin, essentially, like Catholics teach. You can sin at any time and lose your salvation, according to heretics. That's not what the Bible teaches. When you get saved, you're coming there and you are dying to your self-righteousness. You're no longer thinking that you're a good person. I'll get more into this more as we continue here. But you don't serve sin. You will sin, but it's a thing and it's not a well willful versus, you know, ignorant versus, you know, willful sin. People come up with all these little terms and everything else. My point is, the drunkard that comes to Jesus Christ for salvation, they're wanting help. They're saying, I don't want this life anymore. Please, God, save me. And God saves them and God's Holy Spirit convicts them. You see, does that mean that they're never going to drink again? No, it doesn't mean that. It means that things change now as far as their relationship to God. Now they are a son or a daughter, depending on what they are. Now things change in that sense. All right? But let's continue here. Verse 7. Now he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Dead with Christ. Buried. Your old life dies. Things change. The old man is buried. And you become a new creature in Christ Jesus. Things change. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. Once. Salvation is not a thing of perpetual works that you have to maintain to keep yourself saved. No, it's a one-time thing. All right? You come to the Lord broken at the end of your self-righteousness. You die with Christ. The old man is buried, and you become a new creature. You see? But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. You understand? Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. You're new. New creature in Christ Jesus. It doesn't say there will be no sin therefore in your new, you know, it doesn't say that. It says let not sin reign in your mortal body. Don't let sin just take over and whatever else. You've got to get out of that stuff. It's called sanctification. 13. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. New creature in Christ Jesus. For sin shall not have dominion over you, but ye are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Obeyed not in the sense of your keeping yourself saved or whatever else. No. Why? Because we read over here in verse 10, For in that he died, he died unto sin once. Next verse. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. One time. Salvation. Boom. Dead. Old man's buried. Walking as a new creature in Christ Jesus. Still capable of sin. Still capable of doing stupid things. But what changed? 
The thing that changed is now your sins are forgiven. They're paid for. Now, when you sin, you're going to have a guilty conscience about it. You're going to say, oh, I can't believe that. You're going to feel like dirt when you sin. You're going to understand that sin is negative. Uh, verse 18. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. Your flesh is still capable of very, very wicked sins and prone to it as well. For as ye have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members' servants to righteousness unto holiness. Ye have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity. You see? But you bury that. Even so now, yield your members' servants to righteousness unto holiness. Your new creature. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things, whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. You realize when you get saved, when you are born again, walking in the newness of life there, when you are a new creature in Christ Jesus, in other words, is what I'm trying to say, when you are here, you realize, boy, that was stupid, the stuff I was doing back then. I can't believe I used to drink that much alcohol. I can't believe I used to look at pornography like that. I can't believe I used to be involved in sex perversion. I can't believe I used to lie and steal and cheat and do all those other things. I, I was, oh, why would God save me? Your new creature. The old friends that you used to like to be around and they like to be around you, all of a sudden you're a new creature. They don't want to be around you anymore. All of a sudden you kind of, you know, uh, kind of a, uh, uh, kill your kill joy, as they say, you know, things changed. Verse 22, but now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. You're working right now, building up fruit, building up eternal rewards. And there's supposed to be holiness in your life. Why? In the end, everlasting life. You have everlasting life when you get saved. Don't get me wrong. You have eternal life. You're supposed to know that you have eternal life. 1 John 5.13 talks about that. But the point is, you still are in a corruptible body here on a very wicked planet. And you can still get messed up and you can still blow it as a Christian, which we'll see here in the next verse. Um, you can still mess up very badly. Uh, a lot of heretics out there, especially in the street preaching movement, um, I'm, I'm becoming more and more aware of this, that these people literally are teaching and preaching, going out on the streets and screaming at people and whatever else because they themselves think that they are sinless and perfect and they confess it. They actually say it. They preach it. That they are sinlessly perfect and they don't make mistakes anymore. I have never once preached that. Anybody that tries to put that on me is a lying devil. All right? Look at verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The wages of sin is death. When you get saved, when you are born again, you know that. And you'll sometimes you're down here and you'll do something stupid up here and you regret it and you feel terrible about it. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's written to a Christian in 1 John chapter 1. You are supposed to confess your sins to the Lord. Not to stay saved or maintain your salvation, but because now you've passed from death to life, and when you do something that goes back to death again, when you bring sin into your life, do some kind of stupid thing, you're going to feel, I need to confess that thing to the Lord. I need to get this thing right to restore fellowship. You see? But let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Show you another key thing of this scripture here. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 2, By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have, what? Believed in vain. You know, there's one thing that you can do with this here. That'll be vain. That you can mess up. You want to mess up the gospel? There's one way to do it.
Belief. Your belief can be in vain. You can come with your own thoughts and your own desires and actions and whatever else, and you can totally miss the death, burial, and resurrection. You're supposed to see this in your life. That's the gospel. You're putting your faith in Jesus Christ because you're having to say, okay, he died for my sin. I mean, how can you look at what he had to go through on the cross and not feel convicted about the sins that you're committing in your life? And not feel a desire to say, I need to stop this stuff. How can you do it? I don't understand that. I've never understood that about these false belief people. How that there's no conviction about sin. They'll claim that they're saved. They'll talk a good talk many times. And yet there's no conviction there. There's no disgust at their former life. None. Just insane. But notice there, verse 2, unless you have believed in vain, it doesn't say unless you have repented in, in vain. Unless you have, you know, whatever. The danger is you can believe something in your mind. You can believe that you are trusting in this for your salvation. And yet there's no changed life. Jesus died for your sins. And if that doesn't convict you, if that doesn't bother you, that an innocent man had to take the penalty for what you deserve. There's a problem there. And you say, well, I, I, I believe that way. I, I believe, yeah, you know, I'm a sinner and whatever else. And, uh, and I've, you know, put my faith in Jesus Christ and whatever. Okay, did your life change? Well, there doesn't have to be a change. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? A lot of people out there have believed in vain. That's why they don't relate to any of this stuff right here. Romans chapter 6 is foreign to them. They don't know the first thing about it. There is no change in their life. They haven't really, truly put their faith in the gospel. Be careful who you listen to and make sure that you're not one of these people, the false belief people, the ones that have believed in vain. I mean, I can't understand how somebody can go through life and just kind of look at eternity and just go, yeah, okay, I, I, I'm pretty sure. I'm, I'm, I think I'm good. Um, you got one shot at this thing, one chance, this life, and you don't know when you're going to die. You have no idea. Why is this such a, just a light thing, light attitude? You better make sure that you're saved. Because if you mess up and you end up in hell because of false belief and there's no supernatural change in your life, if you end up in hell, you can't blame me because I'm warning you. Just don't get it. So that is going to be it for this video. Thank you very much for watching. Please get it sorted out.